Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, it's now seven o'clock, and I'd like to start the meeting of, of the Corporate Parenting Committee. I'm Councillor Arnold, and I'm the chair of this committee. Um, I'd like to remind everyone present that the meeting is now being live streamed uh, and will be available on the Council's website. Uh, and those uh, attending virtually on Microsoft Teams, if you could just indicate when you want to speak, and um, Kenna will let me know. Thank you very much. Um, can we move to item one, please? Apologies for absence. Thank you, Chair. We've received apologies from Councillor Pearce and Councillor Polly, and Councillor Roper is joining us this evening via Teams. Okay, thank you very much. Um, item two, minutes. Uh, I move that the minutes of the Corporate Parenting Committee held on the 4th of January 2023 be approved as a correct record. Are there any comments? No. Agreed. Okay, minutes are approved, thank you. Um, item three. I don't believe there are any items of urgent business. Item four, uh, declarations of interest. Does anyone want to declare? No, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and, and could I maybe just ask at this point if we could maybe just go around the room, because we've got a lot of people in the room tonight, uh, if we could just have a quick introduction of, uh, of everybody, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jenny Joslin, um, a foster carer for Thurrock. Um, and also Vice Chair for the FCA. And I'm Wendy Caswell, um, I'm a foster carer for Thurrock and Chair of the One Team. Hi, I'm Laura Hall, I am facilitator of the CICC, uh, the Children in Care Council for Thurrock and I am also a foster carer in Thurrock. Um, hello, I'm Jasmine Gresham, I'm the Chairperson of the CICC. Hello, I'm Joshua Gresham. I am the vice chair or co-vice chair of the CICC. Okay, I'm Lee Watson. I'm a councillor for West Sussex, South Sydney, and perfectly torn Thames Ward. Hi, I'm Michael Carwana Smith. I'm head of children's services for Nelft and Nature's Foundation Trust. Hello, I'm Tina Russell. I'm assistant director for Set Cams and Partnerships. Hello, um, I'm Dean Rufai, I'm the SETCAMS team manager. Hello, I'm Kayleigh Pullen, I'm the head teacher of the virtual school. Hello, I'm Claire Moore, I'm the strategic lead for the Youth Offending Service and Prevention. Good evening, I'm Dan Jones, I'm the strategic lead for Looked After Children at Thurrock. Evening, I'm Janet Simon, I'm the assistant director for Children's Social Care and Early Help. I am Councillor Carter, I'm Vice Chair of this committee and Councillor for Chapel St Mary. That's great, thank you. Um, yeah, please, don't, uh, please don't test me on the names a little bit, a little bit later. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm penned on the screen now. I think we've got Councillor Raper, haven't we? Oh, oh, I'm very sorry. <laughs> good, uh, good evening, I'm Councillor Karen Raper, I'm the Councillor for Tilbury St Chad's. Uh, hi, I'm um, Ines Paris, the designated safeguarding lead for Mid and South Essex Integrated Care Board. And hi, I'm Liz Gilles. I'm the service manager for fostering adoption, um, children with disabilities and placements. And my name is Evelina Sobjian. I'm the uh, assistant director for housing here at Thurrock Council. Thank you very much, and apologies for that. Um, can we now go straight to item five, please? And I believe Dan Jones is going to be presenting that report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the report summarises children's social care performance in respect of looked after children in the third quarter of last year. Um, it's a regular report, so I'll just go through and pick out some key items and then uh, hand back for questioning. So our overall numbers of looked after children remain stable. Um, as, as we expected. Uh, we have seen, as you'll see in the data, an increasing number of unaccompanied children. Um, and this is expected as our quota was increased up to 45. Um, today we're at quota. Uh, you, if you move on in the report, you will find that our missing episodes have reduced compared to last year, which I thought was quite positive. Um, 
and what we're seeing is an improved take up of return home interviews which has been a, a good good piece of progress i know one of the areas the committee has been minded on has been the initial health assessments and there's continues to be close monitoring of uh, the performance here um, at section 5.4 we set out um, the number of children who were who were referred and 29 out of 36 children were referred on time and uh, 10 out of the same 36 children had appointments on time we have had um, considerable support from health colleagues in improving the capacity i don't know um, michael might want to talk more about that uh, during questions but we're hoping that um, there'll be increased capacity from february 2023 but we probably won't see the improved report the performance until uh, into next you know the start of next financial year the first quarter is when we hopefully see that pulling through um, there were some questions in previous committees about the distance of placement from from home uh, the majority of children 70 percent are placed within 20 miles from home and if you look uh, in the report you will find uh, there's a breakdown of the areas they're placed in uh, the largest area we place in outside of thurrock is essex um, which reflects our, our county that's at 6.3 on page 31 and um, then in the greater london area which would reflect that most children are placed within 20 miles of home um, although they might be in a different local authority area beyond that there are some uh, further afield placements which are broken down and give a flavor of um, where our children are placed uh, the leaving care data is similar and we continue to um, perform in line with statistical neighbors Thank you very much, Dan. Um, yeah, I mean, I was going to just lead on this one just very quickly before I open it up to members. Um, I was actually going to ask about the, uh, the initial health assessments um, and the, uh, the, obviously the promise of uh, additional paediatric appointments from February 2023. So I was going to ask if you had any data on that. Uh, is there, I mean, so can you tell if there, is, if there has actually been any improvement on that in, in real terms? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, then if you're happy for me to, to answer that. Um, yes, yeah, so clearly that 29% of, in, of initial health assessments is not what we want to be. The ICB, we have raised it with the ICB, which um, uh, have provided additional, um, uh, additional IHA capacity within the system. As Dan is saying, um, uh, the, uh, the performance, well, we, we, there, there, will, there should be a slight improvement from next quarter. So for quarter four, we should start seeing an improvement. From quarter one next year, this, the, the, the percentage should be significantly better. In terms of data, I think I believe there's a report that will be provided at one, at, at one of the next um, corporate parenting boards. So, uh, so uh, the, the, the data will be there. What I can say is that in quarter three, the number of IHA requests that we were asked to deliver continuously outstrips the number of appointments that are available. In quarter four, so far, January and February and March in, as well, um, uh, the number of IHA appointments available significantly are significantly more than the IHA requests that have come in. So that's why we'll start seeing a trend, that, that trend starts to shift. And from quarter one next year, from quarter one, that will, should be a much better, much better outlook. Okay, I'll leave it there. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Um, thank you for the report. As I'm absolutely devastated, really, that we that we're going to have to wait until quarter one, like next year, to have more resources put in place. Um, sorry, you're going to because I've I've missed a meeting. So there was one at one point that Nelf was sitting here to say that we was in contract that they covered the whole of Essex, and we were part of that contract. And I want you to know what percentage of the resources were dedicated into Thurrock. Um, and why is this taking so long? Because you can see by the data, the unaccompanied minors on their own right, we have just gone up to 45, which is our quota, which I'm pretty sure the way the unaccompanied minors will be start coming through the door right now, we are going to be pushed to take more on because that is a common theme going across London. If you are behind the curve now, how can I feel confident and what are you putting in place to ensure that everything is being done in time fashion, as well as taking, going to be taking on more of these unaccompanied minors that will be coming through? So I'm, I'm quite disappointed because I I'm, was really hoping by now that we, where we were beating up, um, in a sense, the social workers and everything for not doing 
the visits on time, they actually are. But now it's going wrong your end. So I, I just want I just want more confidence because these are our, our children. Yes, thank you. Maybe I wasn't clear enough. Resources have been put in place already in quarter three, but clearly there are children from these, from these appointments, from these 29%, the, the, the ones that haven't been seen, those children would slip into this quarter. So that's why the results and the percentages will not increase immediately. Yeah? So resources, ex extra slots have been put in place. We've had them since January. We've had 36 slots IHAs carried out in February. That's significantly more than any other month. Um, in quarters one, two, um, and pre before that as well. Um, so extra resources are in place. Clearly there's a bit of a lag because, because operationally that's the way it happens where children are being booked in. Yeah, so, 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 but, but that's the only reason why the, person, why the improvement is not showing yet. The improvement is there, but the data will not show it because there's a lag. So just to provide assurance, the resources are there, the resources have been added, yeah, there is, there is an increased resource, and maybe I wasn't clear with my initial answer to that, to that question. Okay, so, sorry, sorry, can I, can I? So, um, I'm hoping that, like, when we come back into court, when we're getting the data into the quarter one next, next May, um, past May, when we're in, um, that it will show a significant improvement on what has actually happened previously to now. Is that what you, you're saying? Because I will hold you to that. Based on current projections, yes. It depends on how many IHAs are, so are always a bit unpredictable. But based on current proje projections, we have been given, the ICB has provided 100 additional slots for IHAs to be provided. Um, that should be the, be the capacity, yes. That should meet the demand, yeah. Yep. Um, so in terms of the unaccompanied minors, where we're getting more of, they're going to need to be evaluated at the same how are you going to um, program them into, you gave an additional 100 slots, but what is the model that's actually carried out that, that it will be taking into consideration their slots as well as the ones that are still coming through where you've only got 100 slots? Because I, I, I'm seriously worried that, as you can see with our, our data, our looked after children are not going down. They're actually the same. And as they're moving on, they're still remaining the same, so more coming into the system. Plus our unaccompanied minors as well, that's going to need assessments. So what extra resources are you going to put in? Because you're still going to need extra resources and the 100 slots. I can only speak behalf, on behalf of NELF. We're a provider organisation. That's a question that probably needs to go to the ICB in terms of resource allocation, not NELF. Can you take that NELF. up, please? And oh, well, I will, I will, I will and raise NELF, it. We, we escalate it continuously. We escalate it continuously to the ICB, which, which looks at, at, the, at the need. Okay. Um, and, and act accordingly, which is we don't have a resource that we can add or no, remove. No, it goes yeah. to the ICB, I'll get that. Yeah. Okay then, so I'm quite happy to take that up if need be as well. Because I'm, I'm, really, I'm really passionate about this. So is that right with you, Chair? Yeah, I believe so, yes. I was just trying to clarify, clarify that, yeah. Can I direct the question to the ICB, please? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hello. So there is ongoing work um, happening across SET to accommodate uh, all um, unaccompanied asylum seekers, their minors. So we know that uh, West Essex have been dealing with this issue for a longer so we are working closely with them to make sure that there is an impact on thorough and and we are monitoring closely um and as michael said we've already commissioned a hundred a hundred extra ihas and we'll continue to review the situation and any improvements or any amendments required would you like to continue can i just ask one question you want one more and then i'll let I'm a couple of the members in can I ask you how you're monitoring Thurrock? Excuse me, I couldn't. You just said that you were monitoring Thurrock as part of the ICB across yeah. West, West Essex. You are or wherever you are monitoring Thurrock. How are you monitoring Thurrock? At what point will you say that we need more resources? So I started my role on the 1st of March. 
So we have established meetings with colleagues in social care and with colleagues in NELFT so we can understand what the operational issues are and any escalation from both of those teams comes to us in the ICB and we'll then liaise directly with the commissioners and other teams across set. So until those teams are escalating to us that there is no capacity, um, we will assume that things are in hand. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I've got two other councillors wishing to speak, and I'm really not sure what order they were, so I'll allow Councillor uh, Carter next and then to Councillor Raper. Um, well, it seems a, a, a lot's being said. I very much want to echo what Councillor Watson has said. I think she very fiercely thought our position here is this bit has been quite an ongoing fight, and so thank you for that. Uh, um, the, I heard a lot of terms like... Um, there will be significant there will be improve, a small improvement then i heard we've got projections but nothing was nailed down where are you looking to be at in this year where where are we, we see here we're 29% now where are we going to be by the end of the year in the amount of ihas completed in time I wish I had a crystal ball, but with IHAs, it's a bit with with with, with, with children coming into and coming into care. We haven't got an exact amount of how many children are going to come into care. We can have projections in terms of if we're going to have more uncompleted asylum seekers. We know we've got significantly more slots. We know what the trends have been over previous years. We know that there's usually peaks of of IHA requests in uh, at the, in quarter three and the beginning of quarter four usually. If the trends are followed by the summer, um, uh, by, by quarter one, um, uh, we, will, we will start seeing those numbers getting significantly closer again to, to, to where we want to be on target. But that being said, if you look at this data, um, with the target being at 90%, even if we delivered all the target IHAs, on, and then correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm reading, misreading the data, even if we delivered all IHAs on time, we would still be below 90% because we had four children that we would not have been able to deliver IHAs for. So we would have been below the 90% anyway. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not as easy to say exactly, and, and I wish I could um, tell you we're going to be at 80%. I'm not able to do that. But what, I'm, what I can say is that the ICB has provided additional slots. The ICB has recognized that that the requests, the demand, has exceeded what we were able to deliver and have put resources in place. Can you talk us through the resources, or maybe our guess from the ICB can, that what has been put in place here? Are you happy with me to answer, Ines? Yep. Um, 100, 100 additional slots have been made available. That has been... Um, uh, well, it's 100 slots over a period of time, but we have flexibility with how we deliver those. We're, we're, we're carrying out most of those out um, uh, at this quarter um, to, to catch up and be where we want to be. Um, uh, some of it depends on capacity as well. You need doctor capacity. You can put as many slots as you want. If you haven't got a pediatrician there to deliver the IHA, um, and pediatricians come at a, at a premium, um, uh, you can't just throw money at it. Um, uh, so in February, for example, we delivered 36 initial health assessments. In March, we've got, I believe, on top of my head, um, uh, 21 IHA slots being available, um, uh, more, than, more than the number of requests coming in. So month on month, we are catching up. Um, uh, had a look at the data with, 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 with our social care colleagues this morning. We had three of the IHAs in March being delivered on time which in quarter three wasn't happening. So we will be seeing improvements. So we are catch, we're catching up, but that doesn't mean necessarily they're completed on time because we're still um, f filling the ones that are out of date. Like we, we have a clear KPI here. So when, once you have caught up, do you envision a system where all those slots you have available will be delivered on time. Oh, we, we will need further conversations with our ICP colleagues in, in that case because we need, this is a, a, a solution to a problem that's emerging. We need a longer term solution as well. Yeah? Um, uh, and we will be meeting with our ICP colleagues with, with, with that and reviewing 
reviewing the, 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 the request and the demand coming in and how that is changing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Apologies, Councillor Riper, if you'd like to uh, ask a question now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's just a matter of clarification, but before I ask it, or before I say it, um, can I just go back to the point Ca Councillor Carter was making? In this um, committee, we have on numerous occasions said that we prefer quantitative data rather than subjective statements because we can't truly scrutinise. I'm not, not picking anything in particular from this report, and thank you for the report, but um, as you read through other things, we, we often haven't got anything we can really grab hold of. Now, it has been requested several times, and it, it might be an idea if, if anyone who is producing a report for this committee were reminded of that request that's come for us um, several times. And particularly if you're new, you won't know what we've asked for in the past, perhaps. Uh, my point of clarification is on page 26, the last paragraph in 5.3, it says that um, initial health assessments can't be progressed if uh, parents haven't given consent for med medical treatment and so on. Can you explain what happens if parents haven't given requests, uh, haven't given consent? How, how is that tackled? Uh, I don't know who's going to answer, but I, I could answer if that helps. So, uh, if children are accommodated under Section 20, um, we're reliant on parents' consent. For medical treatment, the parents still hold all of the parental responsibility at that stage. Um, if we felt a child needed urgent treatment and they weren't uh, consenting, then uh, doctors can take a decision at that stage, or we would go to court if we felt there was a, we needed parental responsibility to meet the child's medical needs. Thank you. Is there any other members that just wish to comment on that that uh, subject regarding initial health assessments? No, well, I think I think clearly, clearly from the reaction from members, you know, there's. Uh... Okay, sorry, um, the uh, ICB have got their hand right. Apologies. I, it's fine. Thank I you. just wanted to say that we did submit data on IHAs on our report, but that wasn't part of the agenda, and we did submit it on time. And in that report, you could see the graphs from NAFT with the amount of slots and the IHAs, and also um, the percentage. Um, of average weight. So we did submit that data and it's a shame that it's not here because I think it would have just helped the members to clarify how we, the improvements that have been made and how that has impacted, uh, albeit it was just February, but I think it would have been helpful. And um, I would like to propose for us to present a report at next meeting, if that was that's possible, please. Yes, I mean, I think that's absolutely imperative. Actually, as, as, as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of concern here and, uh, you know, there's uh, many, many questions still yet to be asked. And as, as people have pointed out, and even from my limited experience, this is a, a reoccurring issue that just doesn't seem to want to go away. And we really, really need to get on top of this now and, and come through with some really definitive, correct responses for the committee. So, yeah, I'd like to see that report come back as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Just regarding the report, old oh, Councillor Carter. Uh, well, we, we often get quite fierce when we're discuss, discussing IHAs. I know it's a subject um, everyone in this committee is very passionate about. So I, I think we should say thank you for this report. There is a lot of um, great things in here. Um, I particularly like the, uh, the referrals for the IHAs are are made in time. Uh, there, there was one question I did have, and that was I completely lost my page now. So, <laughs> you, uh, uh, yes, um, the children looked after episode started 3.5. Uh, there was um, two big spikes in quarter three, and then December 22. Uh, I know it's quite normal to have a bit of a spike over December, uh, but the, um, the October one seems a bit unusual. Uh, was there any particular reason for that? Apologies. So my recollection is that was due to sometimes we have large sibling groups coming into care and they're in a small authority that can distort our figures. Um, December, there was an increased number of unaccompanied asylum seeking children coming in alongside some safeguarding entries into care. So I, th I think... Um, there wasn't anything particularly unusual driving that. 
Uh, one of the things I do in my role is I do look back at the entries into care and see if they're all appropriate and necessary, if there's any concerns around them, and I was satisfied that we're safeguard, that the ones who entered on a safeguarding basis should have come into care, and uh, that obviously with the unaccompanied children we have a duty to um, accommodate them, so that, I think that explains the two figures. Uh, going on to, uh, as you just mentioned, the unaccompanied uh, asylum-seeking children, obviously we hit our quota. Um, so um, ha has there, have, have we been able to find good placements for all, all of the um, uh, UASC? Yes, uh, I would say so. Um, so the majority of young people entering care who are unaccompanied are aged between 16 and 17, and we look at what placements may meet their need. We have a strong commissioning arrangement with supported accommodation providers. However, for those children who do re require foster care, we also have um, good foster carers within our own resource who can provide placements and do. We also have good relationships with uh, independent fostering agencies who are specialists in this uh, group of children. Well, uh, thank you for that. That's uh, very welcoming, obviously. These, these uh, children have gone through a lot, so it's very encouraging to hear to hear that. Um, my final question will be on page 23. It is uh, about the children looked after missing episodes. I see a big dip in numbers from uh, 21 to 22 and I'd like to highlight that, as that and I know that work has been being done on this so I thought you might like to uh, talk to the committee about the, what, lo what looks like quite a successful um, project on this. Yeah, we've worked really, really hard with Inspire um, and, the, and the take up of return home interviews has, has significantly increased. And with that take up, there becomes a relationship. So a relationship between the return home interviewer and the young person. So that, that contributes towards the decrease in missing episodes. We have had some children and young people that have um, reached the age of, of 18 and have become adults, um, but we'd, we, we have worked really, really hard with those young people, not just from, in, from Inspire's perspective, but with social workers to make sure that there are really um, clear safety plans in place for these children and, and they are letting us know um, where they're going so they're no longer missing. Thank you. I mean, I've got another quick question, if I can, please. Um, yeah, the report says, uh, and it's on page 30, first paragraph, uh, the report says delays in timetabling uh, the final hearings for placement orders. Uh, in a small number of cases, the parents have been reapplying to court to revoke placement orders. Um, is there a method uh, of trying to identify these potential parents um, before the appeal is made? Um, and do we measure that stat against... Um, other, other sort of authorities. Is there any, is there any way we can sort of identify these cases so earlier? In, in terms of measuring against other authorities, uh, we benchmark our adoption data against um, part of our regional adoption alliance, which is called Adopt East, and that's about nine local authorities across the eastern region, but we also benchmark across the whole of the country as well. Um, so we can see how we're performing against other local authorities of all different sizes and shapes and uh, statistical neighbours and, and physical neighbours, as it were. Um, I, I think the reality is for parents who are having uh, their children not only removed from their care but being told they're going to be placed for adoption is that they, they almost always will want to appeal because they love their children and they wouldn't want uh, their children to be in the care of another family forever where they don't see them again. So there's a lot of challenge. I think some of that's around um, the legal advice that parents are getting now and that's uh, helping them understand what their routes to challenge are. So I think, I think what we... What we honestly do is assume everybody's going to make an appeal because mm -hmm. that would be the understandable thing to do in that position. Um, and, and parents have a legal right to make their appeal, so that can impact on the timescales for the child, but it is their legal right and we have to um, allow them the time to do that. I think one of the, the issues that we've had in this area is that the court capacity has been uh, very limited, which means availability for hearings has been difficult, but we have um, a liaison with the court and where uh, myself or another senior officer is concerned about the, the delays for a child, we can raise it with the, with the senior judge. Okay, yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, I mean, I don't have any other questions as such. Do any other members have any other, any other questions? No. 
I mean, all, I mean, all I'd like to say, really, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a lot of good news in this report, and thank you very much, Dan, for that. Um, but, you know, we, we are just really just coming down to the initial health assessments, and I really think we need to sort of focus in on that area. Now, there's a lot of passion around the room, and we need to get on top of this pretty quickly, really, you know, and actually satisfy members that all is being done, you know, for the, for the children. Um, so I'm, I'm happy just to sum that up now. Is there anything you'd like to say? Janet, thank you. Um, so just in terms of the initial health assessments, just wanted to assure the um, committee that we, have a, we will have a joint report going to Health and Wellbeing Board at the yep. next one, the next one after the elections. We'll be taking it to um, Health and Wellbeing. Um, so that will be a joint report from Health and Children's Social Care. And then that will then come back to corporate parenting. Yep. And by that point, we should be really clear about where we are in terms okay. of quarter one, so that will give us a, a good idea. But we are working closely together to resolve this. OK, thank you, Janet. I mean, it's, it's pleasing to hear, so hopefully we have uh, good news coming down the line after the elections, like you say. Um, well, with that, if I, if I could just wrap that up, I think we've got a recommendation here. Uh, the members note improvements and areas for improvement in children's social care and note the work's been undertaken to ensure good and improving performance. So I guess we're all happy about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if we could now move to item six, which is um, the set child, oh, it's set cams, please, report. And I think that's Tina Russell doing that for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, across um, Southend, Essex and Thorrock Cams, we continue to prioritise um, looked after children to obtain an assessment with us. So when we receive a referral for a looked after child, we offer them an assessment within 10 working days. And um, then as an outcome of that assessment, we have a formulation and offer a care plan within five working days of that assessment. So we prioritise that in order that we get to understand that child's needs as quickly as possible and then should they need to move, um, we can actually uh, facilitate any future treatment for them. So in um, last year, when we're looking at January to December last year, we had um, 25 formal referrals for looked after children into our um, Thurrock team. And out of these 25 referrals, uh, 11 were accepted and 14 were not accepted. Now, the reason for those 14 not being accepted, all of them would have received um, a consultation with the social worker where we look at the child's needs and, form, and undertake a brief assessment with the social worker to look at whether the child needs to um, come into our services or whether there's something more appropriate for the child to have instead of um, a formal uh, set CAMS intervention. And that's what happened in those circumstances. So one of those referrals was actually um, the child wasn't a looked after child at the time, and you'll see that information there. Um, but of the other cases, um, each of the children had that formal first assessment and out of the 11 that were accepted, six remain open to CAMS and are receiving treatment. So as part of that initial um, assessment and that uh, formulation and care planning with uh, social workers, we would discuss a range of options that uh, if the child didn't need a service within set CAMS, what other um, options were available to them and that might be um, something locally provided within their school or it might be us working and giving support to the social worker, foster carer or the school to look at how the child can be supported within the setting that they're in and within the relationships that they're currently in as well. Because some uh, young people prefer to work with the people that they already have relationships with rather than have more, to, more people in their lives um, developing relationships with them if that's not necessary, if it can be done uh, via support with um, that lead practitioner. So within the SETCAMS um, team, we have a lead for LAC, and that uh, lead provides support particularly across all our looked-after children, so they have an oversight of all the looked-after children, 
and also because some of the thorough looked after children will be placed um, in parts of Essex, so they might be open to teams in other parts of the county. So that lack link will link in with those other teams to make sure that those children are getting the right provision within those teams and keep a monitoring of their um, treatment plan as well. And those LAC leads also are available to provide as, um, consultations to social care teams. So even before they make an assessment, they can have a consultation to talk about a child and see um, whether there's support that can be offered by set CAMs or whether there's um, things that we can recommend even before they make an assessment so that we're really liaising well with our social care colleagues to make sure the best plans are in place for um, looked after children. And also those LAC leads that have particular expertise in working with uh, looked after children offer those uh, assessments um, when we have referrals in. And they also work with the team to make sure that across the team there's a good uh, level of experience um, of looked after children's needs within the team and, and offer training to other members of the team. Obviously social care hold um, SP, SP, DQ meetings every month and these are strengths and difficulties questionnaires which is um, a questionnaire that is held um, completed by foster carers and um, the virtual schools that are involved with SDQs and monitoring Collect children's schools yeah. and um, they're a way that we can look at children's emotional needs and the um, set CAM send a representative to that meeting and uh, so we can help to be part of those conversations about children's needs that are identified through the SDQ meetings. So that's a really useful opportunity to talk about those young people's needs if they're um, in foster care or in residential care. Um, the SETCAM's uh, team manager, Dean, here alongside um, myself, attend partnership meetings with social care on a monthly basis so we can talk about any children that are a particular concern, have complex needs, or be in tier four um, inpatient hospitals. And therefore, we use those meetings to think about those young people's needs and what they're going to be when they're discharged from hospital and coming back into the community and how we can support those young people because apart from the local um, team here we also have a crisis service that offers crisis support across the whole of the county a, looked, um, a learning disability team and an eating disorder team that also reach out across the county so those um, services are also provided to thoric young people if they uh, require them so it's really important that we link all those services in as appropriate for children um, particularly if they've had um, hospital admissions um, also in the thoric team they have a sort of a social care hotline so that if social care do want to contact them to discuss a child they can do they have ease of access uh, to do that um, with the thoric team just in your report, you'll notice that um, there's some data around um, the contacts and the method of contacts for young people having treatment with us. And the majority of young people that we see that looked after children are receiving face-to-face. Um, -face. Um, and um, the next is sort of telephone and video consultation, but you'll see that face-to-face -face is the preferred option. And all of our patients have a choice between what type of um, method of contact they would want um, to have their intervention and, and some young people choose face to face and some obviously prefer um, video or telephone. Sorry my report's just been out there so I have to thank you Michael. So if I can just look at the um, data regarding the referral ass uh, to assessment in days, you'll see that the team are, even though we offer that within 10 days, they're overperforming in terms of that we've only had one uh, young person that's waited up to the 10 days that most young people have seen before that time.
and then there's obviously lack consultations and telephone support and you can see there as well the uh, data around that. The total referral to treatment time, we've um, actually given you some young people who are not looked after just so that you can sh see the um, comparison between children that aren't looked after and children that are looked after in terms of um, the split by gender. And um, so that information is just there for you to compare, just for interest really. And again, also um, in terms of ethnic group as well. And then if we just go through the type of treatment that's offered to the LAC referrals, obviously that's broken down here into um, various different interventions that we offer. And um, one of the things that we've been discussing lately is that where uh, the team were offering more pieces of trauma work to young people, they're now offering uh, non-violent resistance training to carers first, often before they um, start any trauma work, just so that they can help to um, give some, um, sort of help the family to sort of stabilise and offer some sort of emotional regulation to those children before we start any sort of more formal trauma treatment, because it's quite important that children are very stable and can um, manage trauma work. So we really think about that in a flexible way as to what the needs of the child are and what we can offer first to make sure that any work that we give is successful and effective. So that gives um, a bit of a range as to, we, we offer lots of different um, treatments. So this is just the kind of ones that we've identified that those looked after children received um, last year. And you'll see as well the uh, data around length of treatment and how long uh, children tend to stay in treatment. Obviously, what we would always aim to do is work on a treatment and then let children have a period whereby they can use the skills that they've learnt and um, then if they needed to come back in for um, additional treatment later or we needed to top that up in some way, then we could. But we're also when we discharge children, we give a very thorough sort of discharge plan to try to prevent relapse. And if they do relapse, we give them some strategies as to how they can manage any sort of relapse symptoms. And um, then there's the lack of referrals currently in treatment. And you'll see there that uh, the majority of children are currently in treatment whilst four are awaiting treatment and will be in treatment um, quite soon. Um, so just um, in terms of the processes, we obviously have a single point of access um, where all our referrals come through our single point of access and they triage those referrals on the day and within two days you'll get a response from that um, referral and if they feel that the team need to work with that child then they will pass it through to the appropriate team. So if the child was placed in Basildon they would pass it through to the Basildon team if it was in you know, South End, they would pass it through to the South End team. But those children residing in Thurrock would be um, sent through to the Thurrock team. And as I say, we have a priority so that those children are slotted in very quickly. Um, and then we have the LAC lead as well, who is able to offer those consultations without a referral and has a regular slot to do so. So that that's another way that we can talk about young people's needs and um, get them into treatment if we need to um, as quickly as possible. Um, so ob obviously we also have a clinician of the day. So if there are difficulties in between treatments or if there's difficulties while young people waiting for treatment, they can al always contact the clinic and speak to the clinician of the day and uh, they'll be able to offer some support. So once a young person is in our system and waiting for a service or in um, in the process of having interventions, we risk assess them continually so that we're keeping contact with them and keeping um, monitoring any risk so that we can make sure that um, 
they're getting the treatment that they need or bring treatment forward if they're waiting and their risk starts to um, increase. So that's just some of the provisions that we have um, within our Thurrock team and within our wider Essex team for looked after children. So are there any questions at all? Lots, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Tina. It's a very detailed report, very well explained. Thank you very much. Um, I'm probably going to have a few hands going up, but I'd like to just get in first with a quick one, can, if I can, just before opening it up. Um, I've, I've written this down, so it might, please bear with me. Um, in your report, it states that the, the typical treatment for children looked after is usually trauma-focused pieces of work, um, but your data suggests that only four young people receive trauma-focused treatment in a year. Are you able to say what percentage or how many referrals regarding children looked after relate to trauma? Um, and what other treatments are available for children who have experienced trauma and whether these needs are met by CAMS? So in, in regards to your question, thank you. I think it's a very important question and it's something that we look at um, very carefully and sensitively. Um, our data does indicate that although the general sense is trauma related, however, as Tito clearly stated, that in order to commence trauma work, there needs to be an intervention of stabilization in the first instance. We are having the majority of the young people may, may not necessarily be ready for trauma, may not be in a position to commence trauma. So majority of the work as of last year has been around stabilization. And we are working very closely with the foster carers to ensure that the young people are stable and then with the hope that eventually they'll be able to access the trauma piece of work. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll leave that one there. Uh, any other questions from members? Councillor Cart, I think, first. Thank you. Well, I would uh, come on to uh, what you were just saying there. Thank you. Firstly, thank you for your report. Um, with uh, trauma in particular, it, there's many cases where um, uh, people don't actually engage with any trauma workshops until they're adults, and they don't. Uh, it's very often uh, recognised that um, they people don't recognise that they've experienced trauma. They don't ex uh, realise that it's affected them for so long. So, uh, and you say it's about stabilisation. I do like that because people aren't ready to engage. But how do you uh, make the children aware? that there is always that door open to them if they are willing to engage. I think you're perfectly right there, and thank you for raising that. So it's important that that's why we make sure that we're always um, trying to inform young people that our, we do have an open door. So um, obviously we take referrals from professionals, but we also take referrals from young people and their carers or parents as well. So young people can refer themselves, which I think is really important. We run um, participation groups as well, so young people um, are invited in to actually talk to us about how services can be accessed and all the time we're working with them to collaborate around how we can make ease of access for young people that might want to come forward themselves and particularly around our looked after children we do accept self referrals without um, so under 16 we would have to say that social workers have to be informed of the referral but over 16 we can offer them the same as we would offer any of our other children that they can come forward and have a service in their own right without having the consent of their parent um, and so that way it just gives them access to the service if they do want to come later and find out more about their, their sort of rights services and what's on offer we do um, we have leaflets which outline all the services we we provide so that young people can see what the types of therapies are and um, we have an Instagram account so that they can go into that Instagram account and find out about um, methods of um, interventions and things and what might be available to them. So we try to offer sort of a range of um, opportunities really for them to have access um, with us. Thank you, Councillor Carter. Anyone else like to speak? Any other member? Uh, I just wanted to ask, do you have any comparative data against perhaps other local authorities? Because when I look at the number 25 referrals, that's across the whole year. 
is is that typical? Because I know we have a lot of children looked after, and when I think about the profile of special educational needs, you know, 50% of my pupils have special educational needs, and the biggest in their primary um, need is social, emotional, and mental health. So that figure of 25, is that a typical figure, or um, do we need to look at our referrals or our processes to make sure that children are getting the, the support they need? Um, you're obviously quite a small authority here, so in comparison to other small authorities, your referral numbers are more or less the same. Um, in bigger authorities like Essex, we obviously have a, a larger number. Um, I think we have to look at the SETCAMS provision as being part of a really big system of support for children and young people. So we obviously have the mental health in schools support teams um, and we have other sort of ranges of um, support that's available in schools, in GP services, we're branching into GP services, um, you know, so that young people can access support at different places. And that's all part of the commissioning as well. So when we were commissioned um, as a service, it was identified that a lot of the services at a sort of tier two level are delivered in the community, so by school councillors, by voluntary sector organisations, and those, um, those services that are available are there to support young people and to stop children escalating to the point. Also, I think social workers themselves are very skilled at supporting um, families and carers with um, supporting young people's emotional needs. So there's a lot of work that happens, you know, that's relationship-based work as well. So a lot of young people are getting their emotional and uh, needs met in that way. And so we probably take, we see the more complex children in a sense. And so I think that, you know, these are the referrals that we received. So these mm -hmm. are the ones that social workers felt that, you know, even after a consultation with us, that they wanted us to actually um, have a formal assessment of, but obviously if they referred more, we would we would screen and triage and offer those assessments more. So I hope that's helpful. But we do obviously also have the data from Essex and from Southend, so um, we could bring that as a comparison if that's helpful at a later stage. I'm wondering if. Um, you were talking about tier two services um, are being supported within perhaps a school-based environment. Well, I know that we are spending some of the pupil premium plus funding that's distributed to schools on school counsellors. Um, now, if they weren't eligible for that pupil premium plus funding, they wouldn't be able to have that. And sometimes we provide additional funding to support that. So I'm just one, I don't know whether I'm thinking out loud here, I'm wondering if that is kind of masking a bigger, not an issue, but a, a bigger picture of what's happening because the virtual school are providing funds from the Pupil Premium Plus to support their mental health and wellbeing within the school, which that funding is primarily aimed at improving attainment. Now you could argue that if you have better mental health, you will attain better. But um, it, I'm just wondering if we, I might need to be having some conversations to think about how much of that funding is actually being spent to support the mental health of our looked after children. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Councillor Carter has indicated. Do you wish to speak at all? Councillor Watson. Do uh, my, mine is quite quick, I oh. promise. <laughs> uh, hey, on page 19, it, it just says about um, those awaiting treatment as four. I was just wondering if we have any numbers for how long those four have been awaiting treatment. So, so the data, and I, and I, and I guess I apologise on behalf of SETCAMS, that this is quite lagged in terms of the data is quite historic. So I'm assuming, um, and I'm guessing our most reviews is that most young people that were waiting are now 
been assessed or are in treatment. So I could assure the panel that um, most young people from this data are been, have been assessed and have been treatment. So the data was pulled a year ago. Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your report. And I actually admire Cams, really, because of the amount of work you do for the limited resources that you're on and the amount of, that goes through your doorways. I, I absolutely admire what you do. Um, we were talking about a relapse. If you had a relapse of a child, do, do they fast track, or a young person, sorry, do they fast track back into CAMS if they need to, like immediately to see a consultant, a, a counsellor? So basically, um, it depends as well on the timing of the relapse and the complex, you know, the um, level of relapse as to how quickly they would get in and how quickly they would need to see um, a psychiatrist, for instance. So. If a young person's been discharged from like um, a tier four unit and then gradually they were discharged and then they needed to come back into service, we would see them really quickly. So um, some young people come back because they have a little wobble and they forget to use some of the strategies that we've offered. So we often meet with them or we talk to them about their the strategies that we provided for them and how they, you know, what's caused them to find it difficult to use them and how can we sort of refresh that for them. And so we do, you know, we try sort of a one-off sort of consultation. But most of our young people, that if they do have a relapse, they would come in quite quickly, I would say. Really, wouldn't you, Jean? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, so in London currently as it stands with CAMS, is they're, they're absolutely rammed. However, there's a different type of trauma that is actually being seen now through children in London, in schools, where schools are now finding it very, quite difficult to cope, and that's actually PTSD. So how are you, how do you, I can put it, that's a different type of trauma that none of us have ever got. So are you preparing CAMS here? just in case we see that level of trauma that sits out here on referral from, from place. Because we have got, I'm assuming, we have got homes for Ukraine out here and we have got the Afghan resettlement programme, I would assume, out here, mm -hmm. as well as the unaccompanied minors that are coming through. So I'm sure that you've, you must have something for more trauma than any other thing, really, because it's a completely different way. It is completely different and all the time our clinicians are training up on sort of new approaches to use with uh, new presentations that come up and new difficulties. So with uh, post-traumatic stress there's quite a lot of um, information about how you, you know, you need to sort of take care about not rushing in too soon and, and the way that you um, manage young people so that you're not sort of um, causing them to debrief when they're not ready to and things like that. So we have all those sorts of um, trainings so that we're aware of how to approach those young people so that we're not re-traumatising them because you have to be really careful that you're not approaching them in the wrong way and, and causing them to be re-traumatised. So um, that's definitely, I can't say that we've seen high numbers yet, but always um, when we see these themes starting to emerge, when we start to see that coming through to us, we start to bring in that additional support from our senior clinical leads so that uh, we're ready and prepared for that through training. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask Janet, can I just ask you one question? So out of the uh, 25 referrals, and that only 11 was taken, taken in by CAM. Um, what happened to the rest? I think in some ways that's a question for CAMs rather than because, of course, there would be outcomes for those above mm. 14. Mm. Um, so it just it, it's probably a question more for CAMs than it is for social care. Of course, we're, there will be some things, as Keely said, sorry, yeah, I am Keely. Keely. Yes. It's Keely. <laughs> Sorry. You made me think. I yeah. <laughs> so as Keely said, some of, some of those children will be getting um, treatment and, and having um, resources put in through the virtual school. 
and a pupil premium. So there we also sometimes there will be referrals to external agencies if we think that actually a child needs something more than CAM's able to offer. So there is a range of things, but I'm sure Tina's probably probably best place to say what happens to those young people and what the exit plans are. Yeah, so did you want to mention it? Yeah, sorry to pass it on to you, but you've got more direct. No, and, and I think you're right, and I, and I think it's such a good question. One of the expectations for SET CAMS when we do offer consultation is to um, ensure that we are having an exit plan and ensuring that we are, you know, recommending the next approach. And in most cases, we do. Um, there, and I'm going to be honest, there is, um, and I guess working with Dan, there has been um, a, a, I think so. Our colleagues from Social Care identified that we could do a little bit better in, you know, explaining and being a little bit more descriptive in what those exit plans are. And we are, and we have been doing a lot of work around that. And we are doing that. So we're really working around the symptoms and appropriateness of those symptoms and what intervention is best for each particular case. So your question is yes, there are signposting there is a description in the discharge letter to social care around what the best recommendations are from a set can's perspective for the, for those young people so you refer them back to social care if you can't those 14 is that right and then it goes back to social care with a plan and then you pick it up and deal with it is that correct and then you put it through. I'm just trying to get in my head mm. how this works mm. for the 14 that are not accepted because we can't just leave them. There's obviously issues. So it might be. Well, they've been instance. referred in the beginning. There must have been. So I get that. So you, you've said no. You refer with a plan to social care and then you go and look for, for an alternative provider to ensure that they receive the treatment that they require. Is that right? It will depend, I suppose, on what the plan is. Mm. So it can be anything from, I don't know, that they're accessing something through school, or it could be that they need something wider that CAMS aren't able to provide. So it may be that we need to go to a specialist service. So we would always try and follow those plans through. So if, if that's what's identified, that's what we would do. Um, but there's always challenge back as well, so I won't say there isn't. There is always challenge back to CAMS if we think... Actually, this is something you should be doing. That's an ongoing conversation between social care and CAMS about services and about what we think they should be providing. But we will always try and meet the needs of young people wherever possible. Um, and sometimes that might need, mean um, commissioning something externally. So can I just um, give an example? So sometimes we might um, undertake an assessment, for instance, of a young person and identify that they need to have more information about their family history and that's something that's causing them some distress because they're getting upset or worried about something that we think that if they had like um, some life story work undertaken with them that that might help to relieve some of the um, distress that they're you know this is just to give an example so that might be one of the things that we might say to social care in the first instance we feel that some life story work w that's supported by the social worker would actually help with some of the emotional distress that they're feeling so we might recommend something like that that social care would take on um, or if the child was receiving some counselling at school we might look at that and think well they've got a really good relationship they're progressing well why would we unsettle that relationship and you know sometimes young people engage really well with a particular person but then you know they don't engage with another person so it's always a bit based on a relationship so if you've got a good relationship and you're progressing well why risk moving that if if it's if it's doing the right thing for that young person so we might just give some reassurance that that seems to be um, you know effective and then we would just sort of you know say come back to us if that starts to not be effective anymore so that we've got that child on our radar but we wouldn't necessarily be offering intervention at this time so there's a whole range of things that might happen at that meeting or the young person might say I don't actually want to serve this when we get to see the young person they might say well we're not ready for it or we want to come back at a time um, when we want it so you know, there's a whole range of different things. Is that okay? Yeah, well, I just, 
I think as corporate parents, we do need to bear in mind that not all schools do have access to counsellors, though. Um, and not all of our looked after children are placed within Thurrock Borough schools. Uh, so we do need to make sure that we are looking at the needs of every individual child and young person and that their, lo their locality can support those needs. Um, and I think that needs a very careful monitoring. And generally, if they are able to have the counselling within the school environment um, and it's commissioned and, and things like that, then we wouldn't come necessarily to your yourselves anyway because we're trying to get those needs supported in that environment but schools have I'm not entirely sure if everyone's aware of this schools have been allocated 1200 pounds for a lead person to attend training now I'm sure one or two days of training for a teacher I know if I had one or two days of training it wouldn't equip me to deliver counselling mm -hmm. so we do need to bear that in mind that although there is guidance and again it's not statutory although there is guidance that says schools sh should have a mental health lead they would still be a person that perhaps has a, that strong educational background and and isn't equipped to deliver counselling so we I think we just need to bear that in mind as a corporate parent Yeah, I mean, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, there's it's, it's been a lot of very interesting discussion there, questions and answers. And, and, I, and I must confess, it's kind of an area that I'm not really familiar with. And, I, and it's kind of making me think now I need to sort of dive into this a little bit, really, because clearly there's a lot, a lot of stuff to be uh, learnt there. Um, and perhaps this is something that can be brought back to corporate parents in, in the new year or in the new, uh, after the elections. Obviously, I'm not familiar with the... Uh, I'm not aware of what the makeup of that committee is going to be. There may be new members, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think, I think this is definitely a, a topic that needs to be brought back, um, you know, so that we can all learn um, and, and move on and, and come up with some better and maybe more challenging questions as well. Um, and I do have one more question, if, if, if I can be allowed. Um, it's just coming around to the hotline service. Um, does the hotline work well for the local authority? And what does the hotline actually cover? And what what happens after hours? Oh, after hours we, thank you, Dean. I keep forgetting that. Um, after hours, we have um, something, a service called Mental Health Direct, which is our out-of-hours telephone line. So if people are in crisis or they feel that they need support immediately, they can phone through to Mental Health Direct, who will triage um, that call and then if we feel that it's an emergency it's put through to our crisis team that's a 24-7 uh, crisis team they're on call for 24 hours a day seven days a week so we have that opportunity and also somebody from mental health direct would be available to talk to the caller so you know just to talk through what was going on and then be able to say well you know you can phone the team tomorrow or you can be triaged at the spa tomorrow or just give them some advice and support just to how to de-escalate the situation if it's sort of like a behavior um, episode or, or phone through to our crisis team and get an assessment if they should need it and that's out of hours. During the day, in terms of social care, I guess I'd ask you, Dan, whether you find that is something that's really helpful to the service. Uh, I think feedback from the social care teams is that they find that the initial stage of getting a referral into, into CAM is quite straightforward. Um, you know, it can, like all referrals, it can be a bit of a process, but um, they find that initial contact quite quick and the initial response is normally, you know, the, uh, as, as the report will, will show getting that initial consultation back is quite quick. I think the things they may say they struggle with is um, sometimes when the young person's ready to talk and ready to access service, you've got a reachable moment, and that's quite a short window of time. And by the time we've been through that process, we've had a consultation, that, that moment may have passed. Um, and I think the, the other bit of people, that have, they would like to see a great deal of contact time between the CAMS professionals and the young people. I think that's an area where we often have conversation about how how best to do that because there are reasons that have been explained around do we, how many people do we want in the young person's life so i think the social care team has said that the, the direct contact and they find really valuable okay thank you very much i mean i mean i don't think there's any more questions oh one over here thank you um 
I have actually, sorry I'll speak this way, I've actually um, had to make a referral and all the time scales that you've said were correct. Um, we were, we did have a consultation but we were more or less told that there were other issues that needed to be sorted out before um, there was anything that really could be done with CAMS. Um, but my concern is, um, my young person has anxiety, he wouldn't want to speak to a counsellor. No, um, because of his anxiety, it's a new person, he wouldn't want to. So what, what do we do next when, when it comes to that? You know, we try mentoring, but again, it's a new person and the, you know, they're, they're sort of declining that. So his anxiety is still there and it's not being dealt with. Um, but obviously we haven't got a referral um, because CAMS have said that we need to, to nail this other situation down before they will um, do anything. But my concern is what is there apart from counselling? Because sometimes with our young people we have to think out of the box. We can't just have counselling there because there's a lot of children that do not, as Councillor Carter said, they don't even recognise it as trauma. They don't recognise it as anxiety. If I was to say that word to him, he'd go, no, I'm all right. But as, an, as professionals, as adults, we can all see that, you know, he's isolating himself because of his anxiety. So my concern is there needs to be something else apart from counselling, and I don't know what CAMS can offer apart from that. Thank you. But aren't only counselling, so we do have creative therapies as well, like, um, you know, art therapy or puppetry and things like that, so that, you know, I appreciate it's, you know, sometimes it's really difficult to find a way in, and it's about trying to build up that relationship with somebody so you can find a way to interest them enough. And sometimes we've had young people that have been really anxious, and we've had to say, you know, start with five minute telephone calls to them just to try to engage with them and just to try to build up that relationship enough to get some trust so that you can start to just have a conversation with them. And that's where, you know, if we do feel that they've got somebody that they're already engaged with, if we can work through them, sometimes that's an initial way to sort of start that engagement. And I know it's really frustrating because then it feels very slow, but it's really difficult if a young person is that worried about that interaction. So, um, but you know, we're perfectly happy to try to keep him there and try to advise and, and get in and, and offer that because we do recognise that that is a significant difficulty for some young people. Councillor Carter. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to add to that. I, I can't recall if it was CAMS or not, so I'm sorry about this, but um, I, I did work um, in a care home last year for a while, and um, it was uh, very much like you said, a case of someone who was very anxious with new people, and, um, and like such, and this was, a, this was a children's care home for people who broke down their placement, and... Um, they, they went about it as they, this person really liked animals, particularly snakes. So there was a reptile house nearby, and they went on a visit there. And the counselling wasn't official counselling, but it really did help. So I know there are these ways of thinking out the box like you say, and uh, as you come in as well, there, there are these options out there. And it is great to see that we are looking at them a lot more than we would have done 10 years ago. So. Um, young people who have anxiety can be particularly find it particularly difficult to have sort of face to face contact and so if you can sort of have an engage engage with them where you buy, are doing an activity or something alongside them that you can just start to have some gentle discussion whilst you're doing an activity together, be it with you know the one that you've um, given or some art or something like that that you can then you know it's much easier to have a bit of conversation with somebody without giving them eye contact or without necessarily looking at them. So, you know, there's things that we can do, just that it's a very slow process. We actually sat outside somebody's front door in one of our teams. We just sat outside the front door having a conversation through the letterbox and building that up because he wouldn't actually open the front door to us. So we did try that and eventually to try to get him to come to an assessment. So 
Um, I do appreciate how very frustrating that is for parents and carers, though, who just want to know what the difficulties are and how we can help. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I mean, clearly, much to learn, much to learn, and it would be great to to have this back uh, in front of the committee sort of next year, maybe, or later this year. That would be, be really good. And I think it's really good to see, you know, we're, we're, it's really important to see that we need really to have this relationship, a stronger relationship built between the uh, local authority and the integrated care board, um, you know, really just to, to to bring this to the fore, really. Again, we, went, we may have new members next year, and uh, it would be great to continue this, all the good work. There's been a lot of good discussions. So I'm pleased about that. Thank you. Uh, and with that, if I can now move on, uh, we've got a recommendation. Um, it's that set child and adolescent mental health service report for children looked after, January 2022. Uh, December 2022 is noted and reviewed by members. Thank you, Thank you very much. If we could now move on to item number seven, which is the Children in Care Council update and that's been presented by Laura Hall I believe. Oh okay. Seven that is yeah. Yeah it's, it's, a, it's a verbal report. Seven and eight are verbal. Yeah. Welcome. Hello um, so this is our update so at our meeting in Jan, we helped arrange sessions for the summer holidays. Uh, we talked about useful sessions for us as a group, but also like children in care. Um, we talked about resilience groups, different types of training that could be offered to young people, and also sessions about having fun um, and doing things that normal children would do. Um, we spoke about how communication from social care to young people is currently really poor. Uh, we don't get told much. Uh, one of the like group members maybe even got told their um, social worker had left, and she had no idea like who to contact. Um, we also hate how more often than not meetings are changed or social workers turn up late. Um, we also shared experiences about moving, about being moved and taken from home, um, how we didn't feel the children were at the centre of this and decisions were made and we had no idea and had no way to express our feelings or how, or even have our choices considered. Um, we met up for lunch this month um, as February's um, meeting was cancelled due to Laura having COVID. So we went as a group for lunch at Lakeside once she was clear. This was really nice. Uh, we all caught up and supported one of the group members who had unexpectedly moved from her settled placement to Kent. Um, we were able to help her feel better and just have some fun. We spent time as a group talking about how we were all doing and just being able to talk about being in care without being judged by people. Um, we as a group have really bonded and are comfortable in talking about our experiences and supporting each other. We have lots of plans for the year and hope to see some of you at our meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Forgive me, what was your name again? Uh, Jasmine. Gresham. Jasmine, thank you very much for your report. Councillor Carter. Hey Jasmine, those were some um, very powerful words you said there, and I, I, I do um, I do off, I do um, emphasise them quite a bit. I was a looked after child myself, and so I do fully experience, uh, fully understand what you're experiencing there. Uh, um, your centre on communication um, as and the breakdown of it as such between um, between the professionals and yourself is. Um, well, it's always been an ongoing issue, but um, how, how would you, what what suggestions would you make that could help that? Um, I think that when when we don't know what's going on, or if there's or if something's happened and we've just not been notified, then we just feel quite left out and just feel like we have no choice, and we just feel like we have to like just deal with it, whatever comes to us, and personally don't really think that's right I feel like we should 
be told everything that's going on like behind the scenes and just help us feel like comforted in a way of just knowing that we are just going to be told so we don't have to worry about anything that could happen in the future so yeah thank you very, very much for that answer uh, communication is key I, this isn't a question per se it's just a, a weird suggestion to the committee if you will um, I saw this film it was actually uh, during um, trauma training last year um, which explained um, looked at um, how it felt to be taken away and the loss of control of it as you were so well put in there it's called um, vacant and it was about that feeling uh, that it was left with the children with trauma I would strongly suggest all committee members to try and find that film as it is very powerful Well, I certainly will. Absolutely, I'll take that recommendation. Thank you very much. Councillor Watson. Jasmine and... Joshua. Joshua, thanks for coming and thanks for your report. And I don't know how you feel. I was, I was lucky that, you know, in my circumstances, but Councillor Carter has been there and experienced every single step of the way you have. Um, we clearly need to do something about the communication because I think, I think they're, they're, it, it fades in time, and I may be wrong, Councillor Carter or and Jasmine Joshua, but as a child you don't need to know, but as you're getting older and you go through that, that period of, like, you're now teenagers, yes, you need control of your life. You need decisions. You need to make that, that decision, whether it's right for you, or have at least have that conversation. Um, so I don't think it's... Personally, the social worker thinking will just phase you out. I think it's, a bit, it's definitely loss of communication, working out when you are ready to accept that and be able to do that, not really knowing that you've gone through it all anyway, and that's hard enough. So perhaps we can have some lessons learned on, on that sort of thing. And um, I'd really like to come to one of your meetings, one of your groups, and so would we all. And uh, it would be fantastic if you could. You could invite us. So just in response to that, as a group, we are currently looking at writing a letter that's going to be from our Children in Care Council to all to social workers, basically, on how to best communicate with us and, you know, how to be careful. Like, like and, and I know we and I think one of the biggest things that our group have said and all of them have said the same thing is we know you're trying to spare our feelings, but you've. You, you kind of can't forget what we've just been through. So what you're going to tell us is not any worse than what's just happened to us. And that's what a lot of them, they, they think once they're going to care, everything, they seem to be protected from too much. So then they've gone from being somewhere where they know absolutely everything and see things they no child and no, no adult should ever see to everything then being taken away. So there's no, like, transitioning for that. Um, so the the group the group we've talked about writing a letter, which can then hopefully be something that team managers give to all of their new recruits, and all social workers can sort of have reference to it because it's from them direct. It's not from us. It's not from trainees. It's from direct from the children who are currently in care, and all of their different experiences. So we have um, like a list of our dates for the year and booking forms for people to come along, and um, we try and keep it twenty minutes so that the guys can have their time and their food. Um, so what I can do is, if it's okay, is I can send that, send all that information to Keller and she can get it out to everybody. And then people can get back to me and then, you know, like I say, because we, we meet for a few hours so we can get a couple of people in, some, if people want to come the same day and different bits and bobs. And we have stuff really booked in for different dates so I can get back to you and we can sort that out. That Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, I'd like to echo that. I mean, I think it would be really good. And I know we touched on it at last meeting. Um, so, yeah, but I think I'd be really, really interested to do it. And, uh, you know, perhaps to attend with others as well, maybe. It'd be absolutely terrific. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the letter is is excellent initiative, really, isn't it? And I, and I think what's, what's come out of this presentation tonight is really how important the Children in Care Council actually is, because you've now had the opportunity to come here you're actually telling us for yourselves what your views are, and now it's for us to maybe go away and act on that to improve this communication. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased that 
you know, the, the, by coming tonight, you know, there may be some really good, strong, firm action out there, and obviously we can engage further as well. So, I mean, it's, I congratulate you. Well done. Thank you very much for your report. It's been brilliant. Any other questions? Janet. Um, thank you, Jasmine, for that. That was really, really helpful. Um, and I know it's quite hard to come and speak in such a big forum, and you were really, really clear, and so it was really nice to hear what you've got to say. And it's really good to hear that feedback. Um, I suppose what I would say is that sometimes you're right. Probably there is a, a sense of, well, we, we won't, don't, don't say that. But I think it's about recognising the age, understanding, and checking out with young people what they want to hear and what they want to know and kind of just trying to judge it from how the child is reacting, really, or the young person. So I think, you know, we want to hear what you're saying. We need to think about how we consult with you more, how we can include you in our training programmes, because we do have young people who sit on our interview panels and interview social workers, but maybe we need to include you more in our induction of new social workers. But I am keen to hear feedback like that because I think it's how we that's how we improve mm. and I know it's not the experience of every young person but I think it helps us to improve how we work with children and young people so thank you thank you for coming along tonight thank you for saying those things yeah th thank you very much Janet for that it really summed it up very very nicely actually and I, and I would say I'll probably take a few lessons from you actually on how to present something so well so well done thank you you're all right <laughs> <laughs> Um, if I could now maybe move on, there's no... Sorry, Jet, no, there's a hand raised. Oh, very, very sorry. I'm doing it again. Thank you. No, 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 that's fine. Hi, um, thank you for such a powerful statement. I was wondering if it would be um, worth considering recording a video that could be shown an induction, not just for social care, but we could spread it across health as well about, um, you know, a short video with what you just said about how it impacts on, on you not to have that communication and and if that's you know something that we could in health so we could show it to gps and 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 we could share it across the health providers easily so i'm wondering if you'll be worth considering that so yeah definitely once the letter is written it, it might it won't necessarily be just to social workers it, it will probably be to any professional um because what in part of that statement when we went out for lunch there was talk about how the young people felt judged in certain situations and not always in a you know like oh you've been it like but what was it you said about how sometimes if you say someone says oh your parents or you and they go oh no I'm in care and people go oh uh, and it's like they're like they're like like I mean I know my young person he goes what are we talking about it's the best thing that happened to me like so they don't all it's not always a bad it seems to have this reputation of being a bad or a sad thing but for a lot of young people it is the best thing that happened to them so it needs to to recognise that as well. So, yeah, definitely, once it's written, there's no reason why you guys can't share it out to, to everybody. Well, there we go again. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. It's been a really good evening. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, can we now move then to uh, item number eight, and that is the One Team Foster Care Association update. Thank you. Um, I don't know that I've got an update. I just didn't know whether you had any questions but for for myself or Jenny. Uh, we are foster carers. Um, we're part of the foster care, one team foster care association. So we are the link, hopefully, between foster carers and um, management. So if there are issues that... Um, we're not a union, as we keep saying, but <laughs> if there are um, issues that are happening to quite a few carers, then we are able to raise that. Um, I was actually saying to Kenna actually because I got here early um, that um, sort of the communication sort of died out a bit but I'm really pleased to say that it's all getting back on track again um, uh, we've got Janet come in um, to our support groups now which I think really helps and I think she's getting really <laughs> I don't know what she expected the last support group but it was actually really I think it was really positive um, there was a lot of good feedback um, from Janet come in and Dan um, we've got a one team meeting um, next week and um, Elizabeth's coming to that um, so we again we're getting that management feedback um, so yeah I mean obviously we're hopefully there to represent carers Janet has asked for um, things that are important to us so there's hopefully an email going out to all carers um, and 
that hopefully will be fed back to the secretary so that when Janet comes to the support group, it won't be sort of a whole bombardment. We'll have the, the really important stuff at the moment that's going on. And hopefully once that's looked at, we can start looking at the other stuff that is important, but the priorities. Obviously, I think at the moment for foster carers, it's the cost of living. Um, it's making sure that the support's there for foster carers. Um, I don't know what else. <laughs> Throw Jenny under the bus. I think it's retention as well. I think we're concerned about the amount of carers that are leaving. A lot of them, it is from reading reports, it is that carers are getting older and they're just deciding it's getting too hard. And whereas before they might have just thought we'll keep going, now they're just thinking, you know, it's enough now. We've, we've done our bit. Um, and obviously, um, me and Jenny both help with recruitment, so obviously we're trying to get um, more foster carers through the door. Um, I think we did speak about it as a support group, that it's really important. I think that people understand that um, although there's all these issues with funding with Thurrock Council, that's not impacting on fostering. So I think it's a, you know, it's a Facebook group, which there's Mythbusters, so I think it's quite important that we may be get that out there to people we, while we're recruiting. It's quite hard recruiting for Thurrock, in Thurrock, when obviously they know there is a situation uh, with the council and all the debt that's going on. And I don't know all the ins and outs of it. All I know is that Janet's assured me that, you know, fostering is a service that that's not going to impact on us. Um, and, you know, I think it's important that other people get to hear that when we're recruiting. I don't know if anyone has any questions. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I mean, I'm just going to ask a little cheeky little question about actually what, what your concerns are. Uh, but I think you some... some <laughs> but I, 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 I won't press you too much on that one. Yeah. <laughs> obviously, you've given us a lot of information there, and obviously yeah. there's, there's dialogue going on between mm. yourselves and Janet. So I've got a question from uh, Councillor Watson. Thank you. Um, Thanks ever so much. And thanks for the good work you do in the foster carers as well. Um, so Janet goes to your, your group anyway. Um, what else needs to be in your group to support you? For instance, should CAMS go now and again or CIB, ICB go? And what other things does it need for you to be supported as a, as a foster group? Uh, what, what we do is, if there are any things that we would like or any visitors we like, we speak to Sandra and um, she will then speak to whoever, the relevant people, and they get invited to our support group. Um, yeah, that, that's what normally happens. So if there, if there are things that, as a foster carer, you know, whether it might be to do with finance or... Um, I think virtual school have um, yeah, already attended. School. Yeah, So yeah. to come back, actually, <laughs> <laughs> See, we didn't scare them off. <laughs> so, yeah, there, if there are different things, and as I say, it's really helped that now we're get, getting Janet and Dan mm -hmm. are coming, and, you know, they're hearing concerns, um, you know, directly. Obviously, you've got the one team, but if they're coming to support group, then they actually are getting to see a lot more people. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, you know, it, we, we can sort of make a difference that way. At the end of the day, we're hopefully going to be the voice for foster carers because obviously there are about 10 or 12 of us in our group. Mm. So we hopefully can speak, you know, for foster carers. You're always going to have the ones that don't, that don't want to come to different things, don't want to come to support group. Um, you know, we, we hold an, an afternoon tea um, which I spoke to Kenna about as well, because we're going to send an invitation out to the councillors for corporate parents. So 2nd of July, everybody, if you want to put it in your... Um, <laughs> it's an afternoon tea. Um, it's all homemade going, by the foster yeah, carers we, as well. Yeah, we yeah, make so. all the cakes and the sandwiches. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's usually a really nice event. So, yeah, we hold our events. We do Christmas, the children's Christmas party as well. Um, so, yeah, we do different things. But we so we didn't want to just be an organisation that just hold at held events we want to be important to the service we want to be able to put our input you know in the department when when they need it Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Councillor Carter 
Right there. Thank you again for the great work you do. Um, I, I was actually, uh, this was about over half a year ago, I was at Grace Beach and uh, there was a party for um, as someone who'd just been adopted. So two small, uh, I'd say babies, I might be offending a top, <laughs> but <laughs> they were very young. <laughs> and um, they were going into with their adopted uh, parents they'd built up a great relationship with and uh, so um, the fo short term foster carers that they had had were holding that party because they always used to go down to the light ship cafe there, have a coffee have a cake, so it was it was put together and uh, a lot of, um, the, there was a lot of foster carers there, you might, mm. you might have been there uh, possibly I think I know yeah, it might have been, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and uh, it um, and they all spoke about how great the culture was between you all and how, how you do support each other. So um, I'd like to say, ask, is that something that's just improved over the years or um, has it always been good? Uh, yeah. yeah, we do have a foster care WhatsApp group um, where if there's any queries, um, people can ask, answer, ask it. But no, I think... I think you can, only, if, you can only understand it if you're a foster carer because if you, you aren't a foster carer, you don't understand all of the, the joys and the sorrows that come with it. Um, you know, you've, got, you've always got parent, people that are parents that go, oh, God, how, you know, oh, I just tell them to do this. No, you know, there are different things. These, these children have been through different experiences. How you treat your child is not how, you know, we will treat ours because... They've, they've had so much go on for them. So I th that's what, when I say to new foster carers, it's so important that you come to support group. We have an informal coffee morning. Come along. The more um, your support network is there, the better you will be for yourself. Because at the end of the day, if, if we're struggling, we're not going to be there for the children. So it's really important that 100%. we all hold ourselves up. And I think that's what the WhatsApp group does. That's what the support group does. Um, I think that's what the informal coffee morning does. And, you know, we've got all of our own little groups as well. Um, and so, yeah, when we're struggling, we can ring them up and go, oh, my God, you won't believe what they've just done. <laughs> and they'll go, oh, I had to make many you know, of them calls. Yeah, so... <laughs> We are there. I wouldn't say it's got any better or any worse. I think, I think for all, throughout my career of fostering, it's always been other foster carers that have supported me more than yeah. anything, really. I would say so, too. They so, definitely pull you up when you need it. Yeah. They definitely hold you but, up as but well. But they're also quick to say to you, um, no, maybe you shouldn't be doing definitely. that. Um, or they'll maybe say, well, maybe this. try this or yeah. try that. And, and I do, I echo everything Wendy's just said. Yes. It really is down to the support that we give one another um, as much as the support we receive from mm. every other av avenue because we are living it. And mm. um, as much as everyone on the outer side can offer you their knowledge of what they can do, they're not necessarily living it. And another carer is or maybe has previously with previous children that they've had and they'll pull on those resources and they'll share them with you and... Yeah, I don't think you can beat that sometimes, can no. you? So, no. I, no I really sometimes do. you just ring and cry. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but then other you times do. you ring and go, you won't believe, and, you know, he's going into school. And they're like, oh, my God. Everyone else is like, yeah, they go in every day. What's the problem? But That's foster care will yeah. go, oh, my God, what, you mean they've been going in for three days? Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, I think they're there for the good and the bad. So Very much so. It's, it's really good. I mean, it's great to sort of hear the camaraderie there, really, and, 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 the, and the support sort of network going on there. Um, I mean, and I will say again, actually, I would love to actually learn more about yourselves uh, and what you do. And again, I know we talked about this at the last meeting, but uh, it's quite busy for us at the minute, and so uh, so I will try and get to catch up with you and, uh, and actually um, and, and sort of learn more about what you do. Um, and I have got second of the second of July already in my diary, so I really look forward to the tea and cake. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much indeed. It's been very uh, very interesting. Thank you. If we can now move to item number nine, which is obviously related, and it's the recruitment of foster carers, and I believe that's being presented by 
I believe that's being presented by Dan. Thank you. It is. Thank you very much. And a, a hard act to follow. So, <laughs> um, so the report sets out uh, the efforts in, that the local authority is making to, re to recruit foster carers and improve the total number of foster carers that we have. Um, I think you can see that uh, for most young people and children, foster care is their route through care. They spend most of their time in foster placements, uh, either with carers who are approved by the local authority, uh, like uh, Jenny, and or as connected carers. So members of their family or network have been approved as foster carers specifically for them. Um, we've noted uh, that uh, there's quite a lot of activity. We have 74 households at the end of January providing 102 children with care. Um, compared to 106 children placed uh, with independent or other fostering agencies. It's not unusual for Thurrock to sit around the 50% mark, sometimes with a lion's share and sometimes we're not. It's, it's difficult on one set of figures on one particular day to say that's how it always is because it jumps up and down a little bit depending on the uh, num number of children we have with our own carers. But I think what we would say is that we, we would like more foster carers. We would like more capacity. Our carers are going above and beyond have been really since the pandemic to, to, to provide placements for children. Um, the national picture is set out at 2.2 and uh, the, the, some of the things we are seeing locally are being portrayed na uh, nationally. There are fewer foster placements available nationally uh, compared to 2018 and um, there are fewer households applying to foster even when there's a good level of inquiries. In fact, uh, some agencies out there are seeing more inquiries for fewer applications. Um, nationally, 45% of children with independent agencies, so Thurrock isn't that much of an outlier. Um, the Department of Education has recognised in the National Care Review the importance of fostering, which is really positive. It's been a long time since um, fostering has had a lot of national attention, and the government will uh, start a national campaign to recruit 3,000 more foster carers nationally. It's going to start in the North East, and we're very interested to see what they're going to do, because we feel we're doing a lot already. So we'll be interested to see what they're, they're adding to it. Um, it's worth noting that the national minimum allowances will increase for foster carers by 12.43% in uh, April 2023 for each area. So that will be the uh, allowance that the carers get. It's not, that's not necessarily applicable to their fees. Um, the uh, government's also looking at how kinship carers, those connected persons, could be supported in different ways and perhaps in ways that uh, prevent children from coming into the care system. We summarise our recruitment activity and you can see that whilst we've been successful at pulling households in, we've also had uh, a number of households uh, leave fostering. Those reasons for leaving largely, as, as um, has been said already, is largely foster carers reaching the end of their fostering journey. Um, and we carefully look at each application that ends and each time a carer leaves, is there any reasons why, is there any learning? And sometimes we're able to pick something up but sometimes it's just a, a natural end to a, to a fostering career. Uh, we set out our, uh, the foster carer's journey over the year and how many applications we've had and at what points they've dipped out. We also set out the impact of some of our advertising. I think one of the things I would just draw uh, committee members' attention to is the number of events, and this is events that are staffed by uh, council officers, but also by our foster carers who take the time and trouble to attend. In, in Appendix 1, and we are out there in the community almost all of the time at different events. We're, we're in your local shopping centre. We're probably hanging outside your hairdresser. We're definitely at your family fun day. And if you're going to Tesco to pick up your shopping, we're there too. Um, we've had really good inroads into different parts of the communities and, and different parts of Thurrock. Um, despite all of this and despite the large number of informal inquiries it, it's granted, we haven't seen as many applications as we would like to see. Um, so we are somewhat treading water as a result. Uh, we are keen um, to continue to improve uh, our approach. And with Liz joining us, um, we're looking at reviewing our recruitment approach and to look at a recruitment attention program that includes the package of support to foster carers. Um, some of the support is around uh, financial issues, but it's not just, you know, people don't foster to be rich. Um, so, <laughs> so, but, but also it's that fostering community bit. So what else can we offer? What else can we help the, to help the fostering community develop locally to make it a rewarding experience for our carers more regularly? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Very interesting. It's a very interesting report, actually. Um, before I just invite other members to speak, I just, I, I, when I got the report for the first time, um, I actually kind of thought, 
ah, I can think of a way to recruit more more foster carers. Um, foolishly, uh, I've obviously looked through the report and actually seen to the great lengths that actually go into this and, and the remarkable uh, amount of things that are done actually to recruit new foster carers. I mean, it's, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So the short answer to that is oh, I can't possibly think of another. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I really am interested to hear what, uh, what does come out of that. So if uh, Councillor Carter. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your report. You know this is always going to be a subject I have many questions on, Dan. Um, firstly, uh, I'd like to say uh, these numbers are s still around the same as I saw them at children's for households and their fostering. It might seem to people that this isn't a good thing, that more have left than have been approved, but I think this shows the success of the recruitment scheme as we have... Uh, I, I see it as we have mitigated quite a huge loss in um, foster carers that may have left anyway without the recruitment strategy. And um, uh, the, the way we've been able to keep this service going by this, uh, oh, I must say, one of my favourite schemes that this council runs is, is incredible. And if any councillor or anyone with any um, community uh, interest can recommend events, um, there's one here, 4th of December 2022, um, Grays Beach, uh, I actually recommended that one into... Um, uh, into the uh, fostering team. So, uh, they've all, any um, events you know that are coming up in your ward? I know um, Councillor Watson get, gets quite a lot of events in her ward yeah. because, <laughs> because it's so big. <laughs> it is just a massive ward. <laughs> yeah, and if uh, anyone could just fire in suggestions because um, the, this team would love to engage with as many people as possible and. Uh, I mean, that, it speaks for itself, doesn't it, just how many events they have been to. So, uh, no question, I guess, just keep it up. <laughs> I believe Councillor Rafe has a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Um, going back to 2.1.3, well, 2 <laughs> page 63, talking about um, set, having our children in independent and other fostering agencies, how does the local authority quality assure those? So uh, to be a fostering agency, you have to be registered with Ofsted and, and regularly inspected. So that's one avenue that we use to make sure that the fostering agency is competent. We check their Ofsted report. If they do have development areas, we look at that. Uh, we have a specific commissioning contract, um, which uh, so contracted with the local authority, with a group of uh, fostering agencies. That's where the majority of our independent placements are made and there's quality assurance checks as part of that contract. We would want to make sure that the uh, fostering agency is meeting all its statutory obligations. We want to make sure that the recruitment process is appropriate. Uh, where foster carers are nominated by an independent agency, we make sure we receive a full copy of their assessment detailing all their references and checks and the up-to-date annual review to make sure that their approval is still good. So there's quite a lot of checks we undertake before we we'll accept a placement from an independent agency. Um, once the child is placed, we continue to do our regular visits to the, them. And if there's issues or concerns raised there, then they are raised formally with that agency for them to address, as we would with our own carers. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Council Watson. Thank you for your report. Um, the independent and the fostering agency what is a mile radius outside Thurrock for that? Or are these all in Thurrock? So, so they can be all over the country, uh, an independent fostering agency. Some agencies uh, operate over a local area, but not necessarily tied to a local authority boundary. So there's one uh, independent agency that's based in Thurrock, but works across the whole of South Essex. Other agencies are national companies, so they will have carers all over the country. Um, our children, are, if we go back to the performance report, that, that radius would reflect the fostering pay, uh, placements as well. Most of our fostering placements are in the local area. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry, and I'm pretty sure that our social workers go and visit them wherever they are in the country. Absolutely, yes, face to face visiting. Yes. Brilliant, fantastic, thanks. Thank you. I've just got, just got one small question. It's so it maybe quite obvious, really. Um, it, it, the report says foster carers are much more likely to foster for longer 
career to register with a local authority. Can you just give me an idea why that is, or, or am I sort of, I mean, I know there's the, the council tax why you are, um, but are there any other reasons for that? So uh, if, if you decide you want to foster and you would like to have children placed with you, you're much more likely to have children placed with you if you're fostering for a local authority. Um, we will always look to our own carers first um, because they're the ones we know best and we can do the matching a little bit better because we know our carers, it's all in one place. Um, so our carers are never short of a placement. I would say, <laughs> I'm going to just hide. Never short of a placement. Um, or an extra one or two sometimes. Um, but, but I think it is that, that relationship that you can build, particularly in a small local authority. We have the opportunity to build. A, 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 we know our carers. You know, I know when I meet my carers which children they have, what's going on, and, and they're understood. I think when they're in an independent agency, they're held slightly differently. And uh, that their, their whole experience of fostering is slightly different. It's not to say it's, it's bad, but I, I would suggest that the, the experience in the local authority is better overall. OK, thank you. Uh, if there's no more questions, I mean, I, I, mean, I would like to say it, it has made very... In, oh, oh, question over there. Thank you. It's actually not a question. I was going to say I, I was an, um, an independent fostering uh, a carer prior to coming over to Thurrock. Um, so I started off my fostering journey um, as an IFA, as they call them. Um, but I came over to Thurrock um, within a couple of years, and obviously that's where I've stayed. I've been fostering now for Thurrock for... I've been a foster carer since 2002, and I think I must have come over about three years into my career. And it's so much better coming into a local authority because you actually get to meet the people. It's nice because Thurrock's smaller, so you get to meet the people, you get to meet the social workers more. Um, and I, I feel like as an IFA, um, it's harder to get answers when you're an IFA, whereas I can just pick up the phone, speak to the social worker, or it's just it's so much easier being a local authority carer. So... You know, I would definitely, if anyone ever asked me, I think a lot of people, they look, sadly, at the financial side, but when you actually work it out, like, for like, especially now, I have to say thank you about the council tax. I got my bill today, <laughs> just throwing it out there. I did let out a little cheer. <laughs> uh, when it came in, there was a big fat zero on the so, bottom of yeah. it. <laughs> it thank was you lovely. But, um, yeah, it, it is just, it's just more, um, it, it's just nicer being a... Um, local authority carer and I would always say that to people oh yeah but they pay better it's not always about money Definitely. it's about the support it's about having that connection very quickly the answers really quickly when you're dying for that answer you don't want to have to wait ages to get that answer you need it straight away and most times we get that so Oh, that's really great. I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're sort of able to share that with the committee, actually. I think it's sort of important to be heard, actually. It's uh, yeah, very good. Um, any more questions? And that's a no. Well, if I could then move to the uh, recommendations, and it's, th it's 1.1 through to 1.3. Are we all okay with that? Yeah. Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, if we can now move on to item 10, which is the housing options for care leavers and um, I think that's Luke Fromont is going to be presenting it, it was going to be Luke but oh. he sends his apologies yes. um, so he's unwell today so I'll present if that's okay thank you very much thank okay. you thank you all right, uh, so the report sets out, um, really, we've talked about different parts of the child's journey this evening. So this sets out what happens after the age of 18 and the range of accommodation and housing options that are available to our care experienced young people. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we, we all probably know is that when children turn 18, they don't necessarily leave home straight away. Um, and they uh, might need some additional support in, in those early years of adulthood. Um, what we try and do for, the, for, young, for our group of looked after children is that, that they have a huge range of needs and might be living in a whole range of different settings. So we try and have a range of options as a local authority that uh, support them. So I think one of the things that I wanted to highlight was the social housing that's provided by Thurrock Council and the corporate parenting responsibility that uh, housing have. And I've been really pleased to say that there's been some progress in that in the, in the last year with uh, 
care experience young people being awarded a tenancy once a fortnight, which is real progress from where we were, and we are having regularly, regular liaison um, meetings with housing, and they're offering training and advice to young people who are preparing for a tenancy, and that's been extremely positive. We have the Head Start Housing Scheme, which is also now administered within our, by our housing colleagues, and uh, that provides, if you like, group living and getting ready in, in a council-rented or owned <laughs> property. Um, and you're, you're provided with furnished property, with white goods, Wi-Fi, and uh, a little bit of budgeting advice, and you get used to living independently. Um, we'd see that as a transitionary arrangement. Uh, one of the things I'd also like to highlight is staying put, and this is where our foster carers, you know, they, they, they don't finish at 18. Um, but, but they do carry on, and staying put is a framework that allows someone to remain in their placement after the age of 18, like, children do in, in families and it sets out who will do what but it also continues to provide some financial support uh, to the foster carer to enable them to continue to look after that young person as a young adult. Um, for some children they might have additional needs or uh, additional complexities where they continue to need social services support we make sure as part of the transition planning that uh, referrals to adult services are considered from age 16 and some of those young people move into uh, provision provided by adult services that might be a, a care home or some other environment that adult services provide. We have uh, some commissioned supported accommodation which is from Sanctuary and again for young people that might be some uh, temporary housing while they get used to living independently and Sanctuary offers a higher level of support than perhaps Head Start with some more uh, hours per week. Um, for some children who've been living in semi-independent placements, we, we might extend those post-18 so they can continue to remain there and access their education. Um, where needed, we make sure that temporary accommodation is provided to avoid homelessness for young adults. Um, we also have the Shared Life Scheme. The Shared Life Scheme is uh, not dissimilar to fostering, but fostering for adults. And uh, it allows uh, young people with additional needs to, to continue to remain in a family environment indefinitely so they could remain there into their 50s. Um, we are piloting a property to be rented by children's services for uh, young people whose immigration status is under review so they can't access public funds or progress with a housing application but might have reached a stage where they no longer need the uh, support of semi-supported accommodation. So uh, we are piloting that property and so far... We're having success with those. Uh, I've set out uh, towards the end of the report the different uh, breakdowns so we can see the progress we've made in the social housing office offer to uh, young people with Head Start housing and social housing taking up roughly half of uh, all the accommodation offered. So there's a range of options um, available to young people as they uh, move into adulthood and uh, we hope that that continues to meet need. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, got a question from Councillor Carter. Hi, Dan. Uh, thank you for the report. And uh, I've, so I've seen in other committees, FAG has come a long way in the quality of the homes it, it, it gives the care they deserve. When I left care, I had the top floor of Cadwell High Rise. I just want assurances. I have been told this doesn't happen anymore, but I would like um, assurances from the committee that this, this doesn't happen anymore, basically. <laughs> We're very careful about the uh, properties that we let. So the Head Start housing properties are monitored very closely by officers um, responsible for those properties. And uh, the rest of the provision is largely contracted in some way, so there is some oversight that way. Um, I think for uh, young people moving on to social housing, it, it is around the stock that's available at that time and the properties they bid for. Um, but if it is a, a direct tenancy, then of course it's overseen and maintained by our housing colleagues. So... Yes, I'm, I'm confident that, they, uh, that the placements are well monitored and, and the housing options are well checked. Yeah, I, like I say, I've, I've seen the percentage and it's, got, it's definitely gone up over the years, so uh, certainly a lot better than it was so eight years ago. Yeah. As I think that was quite a low point there and it steadily got better over those years, so I'd like to thank uh, everyone for their, their part in that. Um, Yes, uh, so uh, there's also the part of um, people who stay in care longer or, or stay in their foster homes longer. As I say, uh, Brighton as a council is now um, got, uh, it's a, all children are offered up until 21. I can see the country going this way in 
number of decades. I don't think we're there yet, <laughs> uh, to be honest. But um, it, is that something that could happen in the future? So um, for children who are placed in, in foster care, I think the, the arrangements are there. Um, the, the, I think the bit we can't take away is people's choices. Yeah. So young people <laughs> may not want to stay in their foster placement no, post-18 for, for a variety of reasons. No. Um, I and want to be clear, I yeah. wasn't suggesting no. Brighton are taking away <laughs> <laughs> the rights of children. No, no um, but equally foster carers need to be on board mm -hmm. and, and uh, feel that staying puts right for them as well. So that conversation starts about mm -hmm. 16 and a half. Um, but the uh, arrangements we have and the policy we have, it was re reviewed earlier this year um, to try and make it a bit clearer. But yes, absolutely can continue to 21 for those in foster placements. Mm -hmm. For those in residential care, um, the situation is a little bit more tricky because the, uh, the majority of the regulation of children's homes ends at 18. You can mm -hmm. stay on to the end of the academic year, mm -hmm. um, but it's very difficult. So the government is looking at that and they're proposing staying close as some pilots. There was one pilot in the eastern region that was quite successful recently where um, properties were rented near the children's home so that children's home could continue to support a young person, although they'd be living independently. Um, we think our Head Start housing office is a fairly close offer to that for children who are placed in the Thurrock area. I think our difficulty will be there isn't a national framework to underpin that when they're further afield, but we work very closely to support um, young people coming back into area anyway because we can offer the best support locally for our children. Just to add to that, um, staying put, I would say that staying put is available to any young person who wants it. As Dan says, with the proviso, obviously, that the foster carer wants to do it and the young person wants it. Um, in terms of young people who are placed out of the authority, huh. we try and um, ensure that they can stay close, if at all huh. possible. So for some young people, I don't know, say... We don't have a lot of young people placed at great distance. But if you've been in Manchester, for example, for the mm. past five years, mm. it's unreasonable of the local authority to say, now that you've made your connections, you know, you know there might be an employment, there might be an education in Manchester, mm. for us to say, now that you're 18 and you mm. can't stay in that residential home, you need to come back to Thorough. Yeah. So where, where it's appropriate, we will have conversations mm. to make sure that young people can stay where they are. And just in terms of the social housing, I must say, just sort of Evel Evelina's just at the end of the table there, we've worked really closely mm. with our housing colleagues. And I think we've developed much mm. better relationships over the last year and a half mm. to make sure that our young people have appropriate housing. So if we thought a young person was going to be placed in an area that we thought was unsafe, there would be a conversation about why that mm. wouldn't be appropriate. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but yeah. Thank you. I mean, I'll just come in there because I did have a question written down about accommodation and uh, and really it was just, um, you know, it, it, you know, that just um, is it always the right kind of accommodation for a young person? Uh, but I think you kind of reassured me that uh, this is um, really at the top of your list there. Um, if I could just ask another little question, and it might it might be a little bit odd, but it just as I was reading the report, it, came, it went through my mind. Um, these young adults that are in social housing, um, I mean, if, if a, a, a fault is reported, um, could be a boiler, could be a broken window, etc., 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 I mean, all of these cases are a priority and should all be dealt with um, very, very, very swiftly. But is there, is there a, a, a something in place for um, the, the vulnerable um, adults in these houses to actually get just get that tiny little bit more of attention so that because obviously it can be very stressful if there's a fault you know are they sort of prioritized in any way i can take that um thank you uh, for the question so we we absolutely provide support for vulnerable residents and if if that uh, young person in question would fall under that and um, then we would absolutely extend that there is very often obviously that that um sort of that joint working still continues uh, when when the young people move into the accommodation, so we we can also um, sort of liaise through that. But but there there is there is an offer for, for vulnerable sort of residents out there that we can absolutely invoke and 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 utilise. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions, Councillor Watson? Thank you. Um, 
Evelyn, probably more for you, these questions, unfortunately. So, on the base of social housing, there isn't, there should be an allocation in the voids, how many goes towards children leaving care? If so, do you know how many that is per the, year? There isn't necessarily a, a quota, if that's what you, which you're suggesting. No, there isn't. It's, it's just a band that uh, care leavers uh, 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 get, and uh, obviously we assist with bidding, as as, um, as was explained um, before. As, norm as normal. Um, so what's the head, head start? Is, um, head start is, is a good, I think, personally, it's a really good um, transition into independent living. But what is the average stay in there from actually going in to getting the social housing? So the, the idea behind Head Start is should be anything between six to nine months. And I think it's fair to say that during COVID, those times uh, ended up, those stays ended up being slightly longer. But I think a lot of work has gone into actually moving on um, uh, uh, young people from this accommodation because they just simply are ready. Um, so, so I'm not entirely sure how far away are we from the sort of six to nine months, but that is absolutely at the forefront of, of our thinking that, you know, we, we just prepare young people to independent living as opposed to keep them in head, um, head start housing for much longer. There was also um, a refreshed strategy that we have contributed towards where we've um, um, sort of committed to numbers. And I don't remember, Janet, whether it was additional... 12 or 21, the, the figures always sort of uh, play, um, play with me, but we sort of um, committed to, to ex expanding, essentially, Head Start over the uh, lifetime of the next um, strategy. Thank you. I've got to okay. So, 3.37 um, is temporary accommodation. Now, some of our, uh, our young people leaving care are going into temporary accommodation. The 56 rule is in is on temporary accommodation and I'm pretty sure they probably have a personal housing plan to go along with it that, so in terms of that the realistic is that they will be in there more than 56 days so what is your process do you then follow the homelessness route or do you then say because of the circumstances that they're our children originally anyway do we, I know that we can extend that 56 days to however we want to do so what do we normally do around that? And, do, and are they also, in terms of accommodation, they normally you move room to room or hotel to hotel. Um, do we try to maintain them in the same place so they've got that bit of continuity of where they're living and, and everything else? I think the starting point is uh, really, um, Councillor Watson, to say that we would only place a young person in temporary accommodation if there's absolutely no other option. And that happens very rare, and that's, um, that's sort of, uh, you know, almost, almost um, kind of nothing available at the time. So uh, we would... Uh, I don't think that the sort of the rule around 56 days, it's, it's more about the people that approach us that we actually need to take time to review the position and establish what sort of duty we owe them. I think with our young people, it's a lot easier to establish whether we're in duty and obviously the starting positions that we do. So I think the, the temporary accommodation... The rules don't necessarily apply in the same way, if you know what I mean. I mean, perhaps colleagues from Children's Services could help, but that's, that, that, is, that is, you know, a short-term stay for when nothing else is available that is suitable for, for the young person and the current placement is either running out or it's no longer suitable or something else happens. In terms of us keeping uh, young people in temporary accommodation as short as possible and we would not move people on from temporary accommodation uh, um, absolutely, unless something happens or there is a request coming directly from from that individual, but we would uh, try and uh, you know make it as as much of a stable home as possible, even though by its nature it, it's transient and temporary. Thank you very much. It's uh, again again very very interesting, um, you know, and it's really reassuring that uh, our young people are entering into sort of adulthood was so well cared for um, and to such a high degree. So it's, it's been a very interesting report. Are there, are there any more questions on it? No, thank you. Okay, well, if, uh, again, if I could then just... Uh
move to the recommendations and that is for the committee to note the range of accommodations options provided to care experienced young people on leaving care and how Thorot Council is discharging its corporate parenting duty. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, and I think that just leaves the work pro programme to move on to now. Um, obviously it's the end of the uh, end of the year for this particular committee at this particular time. Um, I mean, moving forward, there's obviously nothing on the uh, work programme, and I must confess, Councillor Carter. I think every single councillor on this committee is completely fine with saying that we want that NELF report to come back. I know it's normal we wait for the new chair, but I think it's pretty unanimous. <laughs>